So I think I have 20 minutes. I think people are asleep so from lunch. So I can just go and smoke, right? Okay, I think Mr. Martin wanted to be here, but he was in training, so please accept his apology on that. Um, we basically control two important portfolio, compute and storage. Uh, as my old days from search engine optimization days, you, we used to have this entire box and row of uh, devices into data center. Those days are gone. Compute and storage are interconnected, but as you can see, the success of some of the search engines, they separate them out. And as compute went on other side, storage can be anywhere, anytime. Uh, we serve warfighters. I ask that question every day why I'm here to serve the warfighters. And our main duty is to provide anywhere, anytime, on acceptable devices or approved devices secure access. And that's one of the most important duty that we never forget. As we move forward, um, this was our current organization structure. As Mr. Bennett talked about, we have implementation division that takes requirement from the left side, design it, uh, same thing, uh, application, I think most of you know DEE, uh, Defense Enterprise Email Services, uh, ECVOIP, EVOIP under Paul uh, for application division. We have cyber division and IT services division, which is our internal DSA division, which basically takes care of our internal IT. And this independent data centers that came as a part of our REOG. Now I'm going to go to the next slide. That's the future. What we did is, as Mr. Bennett talked about, took all those data centers and kind of collapsed in a line of business under ecosystem. So this is the one entity that gonna bring the standardization. As we move towards, because we have to reduce the cost, money is not going up. So we are trying to deliver the standardized service which gonna help, we listen to the industry. This is gonna bring the standardization, one way of doing the business. And you have one, it's also helps our mission partners because you have one value button, one person responsible for it. And we converted that underneath of that as a line of business. You have all those line of business that's kind of what we did is a like function. We put it into collapse under the particular line of business. So you can see here under communication, we will cover infrastructures as well as sustainment activities under cyber, all things cyber, as you know, cyber is a big these days, and we need to make sure we are protecting the data. So that would be all things cyber, including scanning to everything. Uh, data center, which will have a capacity management and implementation and sustainment. Uh, that's one is the gateway for our mission partner. Any new requirements gonna go through that particular interface. In infrastructure side, we're gonna cover storage, uh, virtualization, uh, chain management, all those capability. Mainframe, all thing mainframe, self-explain, server, that's why we are gonna cover all the uh, operating environments that we manage uh, and sustainment of those. And special services, which is, there is always certain unique services that which DISA provides, which doesn't fit anywhere else. That's where they are gonna go. And we hope by bringing this change, we will have standardization for the tools, and we will have a single reporting structure, and that's gonna bring the simplicity. Our main goal is as we move forward for standardization, optimization, and rationalization, this particular part is gonna help us to move towards that services. So we can deliver the services that our mission partner demands and sustain it. Uh, in order to do that, another important part is we need to bring more automation and standardization. We have made some progress on uh, transport side, right, uh, software-defined networks. But as we eliminate those tow pipe under uh, collapsing those data centers into the line of business and scale the capacity on this, we are more trying to concentrate on using the data and intelligence to, to translate that into action all automation, right? Inside a thread, all those things can go away if we really can do it 100% that. Uh, this also brings simplicity, automation, self-provisioning, 
like mission partner wants everything was due yesterday when you talk to mission partner right so we can deliver things right away delivery time is shortened we have standardized way of doing these things server provisioning self healing basically i would like to use the word called software defined intelligence right self healing when things goes wrong it heals by itself less and less human interaction so less chance of error and hopefully that's also been this speed and agility as we are looking into that and we move forward that's the area we are trying to really concentrate especially software defined infrastructure because software defined entire data center that's our goal and that's probably the place we really need people's help as we move forward that i'm going to set a stage for my friend john here that we move more and more look at those both things current and future especially pay attention on the last two things software as a service as we try to do more and more i, I hate to use word but app optimization idea is to have everything kind of app and then we can move it anywhere anytime and when you have self healing that hopefully helps us with security too so i will hand it over to john all right thank you so uh, good afternoon everybody my name is john hale i'm the chief of the cloud portfolio at disa and so uh, captain holslander this morning brought it up so from an organizational perspective i actually work for captain holslander in the software development uh, directorate under uh, mr rivera but from a from a reporting purposes and from a portfolio perspective i answer up through mr shaw mr martin and mr bennett so it you know part of the question was how do we sync keep both sides of the uh, of the of the of this organization synchronized and and this is one example of that so organizationally i work on one side but from a portfolio perspective uh, my job is primarily to support uh, mr bennett from a compute and storage perspective so overall you know i stood here last year and i talked a lot about cloud and about what we were doing and where we were going with a cloud perspective um, <clears throat> and th this slide really has not changed dramatically since last year, I just want to highlight a couple of key accomplishments that we've done over the last year. So, you know, as I said in the past, no matter what we do from a cloud computing perspective, there's still a need for traditional compute. There's still a need for traditional data centers, and we see those going forward uh, simply because there are applications and capabilities that can't be put in the cloud environment because they either don't fit or there's simply no money in the budget to modernize them and move them to that environment. So, uh, on the far right hand side of the slide, we have our MillCloud 2.0 initiative, which is basically bringing a commercial cloud provider into our data centers to operate commercial cloud capabilities for the DoD from our, from our data centers. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But as Mr. Shaw pointed out, the bottom part of the slide, infrastructure as a service and software as a service, that's really where we see the big bang for the buck going forward from the Department of Defense perspective. Um, and so while we're not necessarily responsible for, for providing infrastructure as a service and software as a service in those commercial cloud environments, what we are responsible for is providing the necessary pieces so that mission partners can meet their security needs as they move their workloads to those environments. And I'll talk a little bit about that in this slide. So quick, quick update about MillCloud 2.0. So last year I stood here with Mr. Martin and I told you that we were going to release the MillCloud 2.0 RFP uh, in fiscal year. Uh, 16 and so we did an RFI we did a draft RFP we had an industry day we did two more draft RFPs and we ultimately released the RFP and we closed it out by the end of the fiscal year so we're in source selection right now uh, but basically I, and I'm not going to go into too much more detail about the contract since we're in source selection but basically the, the key, big key concepts behind the mill cloud contract we're bringing a commercial cloud provider onto our, into our data centers and providing commercial cloud services from our data centers. Uh, the key benefit there for the department perspective is, is our data stays in-house on our, in our facilities. And for certain mission sets, that's still a core requirement. Um, you know, and, I, and, and the other kind of side of the MillCloud 2.0 thing that really is important is, is the utility-based computing model. Um, one of the benefits of leveraging commercial cloud capabilities in the past has been utility-based billing. You know, from a department perspective, we struggle with that, right? So, uh, you know, we're used to planning, planning acquisitions out five years in advance, palming for the money, putting it towards contracts, mippering the money around. Um, and when you move to a, a system like utility-based computing, 
we struggle with that model, right? How do we translate between those two? So Mill Cloud 2.0 is really kind of, kind of, it's going to break some eggs as far as utility-based billing within the department. So uh, we hope to see a lot of progress there from that perspective. Um, so big key objectives were the fact that uh, it was going to provide a, a key infrastructure on our property and, and reduce our total cost of ownership for cloud-based computing as on-prem. Um, one of the key takeaways from, from the Mill Cloud 2.0 effort is really to, uh, to ensure that we can provide cloud-based services and still meet all the department's needs from a security perspective uh, while still offering that utility-based computing model. So <clears throat> the, the other part of that that I talked about, so we have the, the software as a service and the infrastructure as a service capabilities, which we see our mission partners leveraging more and more. Uh, we see that as being the biggest bang for the buck from a computing perspective going forward. Uh, there's a lot of demand from our mission partners for software as a service. Um, and so what we're doing is we, we started this effort this year called SCCA, the Secure Cloud Computing Architecture. And it's a key set of four services, and that's what's in those orange boxes on the screen. So number one is we have our CAP, our cloud access points, uh, down in the bottom part of the screen. And the cloud access points are really a thin layer between our networks and the commercial cloud providers' networks. Uh, that's basically our last uh, protection point uh, in case of, a, of an issue between the commercial cloud provider and our networks. Um, likewise, it's key to point out that all traffic from a level four, uh, from a provisional authorization level four or higher data perspective, so anything that's FOUO or above, uh, that's being stored in the commercial cloud environment would pass through those cloud access points. Um, and, and those are, there's multiple cloud access points, they're geographically diverse, uh, and, and so that we have that capability with our commercial cloud providers. The next two boxes that I'll go up, uh, VDSS and VDMS, or the Virtual Data Center Security Stack and the Virtual Data Center Management Services, and the definition for these are on the next slide, so please don't, don't have to, you don't have to write these down. They're in the slide deck, which is available from the website. Um, so VDSS and VDMS are really about providing core security services in the commercial cloud environment that our mission partners are, ex are expecting to have. So when a mission partner, a DOD mission partner brings workload to DISA um, or, or to a D DOD data center, they get a certain set of security services as part of that effort. Um, and so when they move to commercial cloud, they, they don't necessarily get those same set of services. So that a lot of times they have to build it themselves. And there's an added cost involved in that. And some of the early adopters of, of commercial cloud from a DOD perspective found that there was added cost in the initial implementation, which you know, wasn't necessarily always calculated into the business case analysis. So what we're doing is by fielding VDSS and VDMS, we're going to provide those core set of security services in the cloud provider's virtual environment uh, as part of the core service that, that, that DISA provides. So when our mission partners move their workload into a commercial cloud provider who's received an authorization, an example would be somebody like Amazon or Microsoft Azure or Oracle or, or those kind of organizations, there will be a set of virtualized services running in their cloud environment run by DISA that will provide key security services to that mission partner so that they can go through and get their necessary ATO and approval from their authorizing official to operate in that environment. So these are key things that they just, basic functionality that they need. And, I, and I'll, I'll describe them a little bit more in the next slide. The last one up there, TCCM, is actually not a material solution, right? So this is a solution to solve the issue with key and privilege management in a commercial cloud environment. When you sign up for a commercial cloud environment as a DOD mission partner, you get a set of credentials. Sometimes it's a username, password, sometimes it's a, it's a token, whatever it happens to be. And those credentials give you God privilege within your environment in that commercial cloud environment, um, which is a good thing. It allows you to do lots of configuration, makes a lot, a lot of changes, get everything operational. It's also a bad thing in the fact that you can do really bad things like punch holes into the backside of the network. So TCCM is basically where we would take your credentials that you receive from the commercial cloud provider, and they're, they're given to a third-party organization who manages those credentials and they issue you child credentials 
uh, uh, with lower privileges necessary to do your day-to-day -day operations in the commercial cloud environment. So it's a trust but verify system where multiple people have eyesight on those credentials. Okay? So this is my last slide, but basically here are the, the key parts that I was talking about in there. Uh, the virtual data center security stack, you know, those are going to be things like your web application firewalls, your intrusion detection, intrusion prevention, uh, all of the kind of things, uh, full packet captures in there also as a requirement in the virtual data center security stack. And then your virtual data center management services, those are the things above and beyond the OS level necessary to operate in an, in an environment, a DoD environment. So um, HBSS, scanning, uh, patches, configuration management, all those kind of things that you get when you're in a traditional DoD data center that when you move to a commercial cloud environment, you don't get natively. Now, people ask about patching and patch management and those kind of things. You know, you can, if you're in a commercial cloud environment, you absolutely could have your system, your Windows system, go out and get its Windows updates from Microsoft. The way commercial cloud providers work and the way they bill is based on I.O. in and out of their environment. Okay? So when your Windows systems running in a particular cloud environment go out to Win Microsoft and, and receive a Windows update and bring it back, you're paying for that I.O. Okay? If we move those patches out there into that commercial cloud environment, the, into a DoD repository, and you pull it from that DoD repository, you're not having to pay for the I.O. because you're not actually leaving the commercial cloud provider space. Okay? So things like that, simple little things like that, is all about driving down TCO. Right? So we pay a little bit up front for the VDMS capabilities, but in the long run, the, long run, the TCO is a lot more, a lot more uh, palatable because you're not having as much I.O. out to, to uh, do things like update Windows or update Red Hat or those kind of capabilities. Um, status down at the bottom, this is not a contract that we're letting. We're actually using capabilities that are on the approved product list today. We're taking them and putting them and assembling them together into a, in, a government, in a government lab, and we're going to put them out into production. Um, the reason why we're here to talk about it is because our mission partners, um, when they move capabilities to the cloud, and when I say mission partners, I'm talking about the services, agencies, and COCOMs, when they move their capabilities to the commercial cloud, they need to make sure that they work in this model. So you guys need to know what we're doing from a security perspective so that when you work with them, you're kind of in the know already, right? So you don't have to relearn the system. So uh, with that, I believe that's my last slide. And after this, we have the acquisition slides. Yep. And I'll hand it back to Mr. Shaw. Okay, on the acquisition side. So the first one, we have a facility support, basically design support contract. Uh, second one is a DOD DMC. This is a Columbus uh, support contract. Uh, so it's our data center in a Columbus. Uh, the third one is a third party legacy. So the things that doesn't fit traditionally in our capacity contracts is the one. I think we are on about 10th or 11th year on a capacity contracts. And actually, only last week I had a two industry known big companies asking us about how DSA is doing their capacity contracts as well as two federal agencies. So I think we are very popular in that side. Uh, these are the three capacity uh, contracts for a processor. As you remember from the last uh, uh, forecast to industry briefing that we separate out each and every processor and this is three of them. Uh, this one, the number one is here uh, OKC, basically Oklahoma City support contract for network server and technical support. Uh, underneath of that is our enterprise storage capacity contract, uh, which is actually a little bit far away. Uh, and the last one is Bahrain support contract. This is Oconos. And that is it. If anybody has any question for me or John? Oh. Thank you, gentlemen. Okay.